So welcome to Inkjet and Indigo Living in Harmony and a sneak peek at Graph Expo. We all love Graph Expo. Uh, just on a side note, I just want to thank Indigo NHP for your support of the Printiverse. Uh, Pat, you've been with me for three years. Mark, you guys are new. Uh, well, with your Indigo hat on, appreciate the uh, support and really looking forward to sharing the cool stuff that HP is doing with everybody at home. But today we're going to talk uh, about how to pretty much make money off of high speed production inkjet and indigo working together. So That's the plan. Um, so um, if you're not familiar with Print Media Center, we provide information and resources to the print and integrated marketing community with some fun in the mix. I always like to preface it with that. Uh, you can uh, read this slide and connect with me in a millions of places, most notably on Print Chat every Wednesday, like today, at four o'clock Eastern time on Twitter. Uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome. You should check it out. Uh, on my site, you could actually get a link to the print chat site and see all the archives and the uh, chat replays. It's it's interesting and topical for everybody. Um, you, If you go to the website, you can uh, see all these ways to connect with us on social media. And if you are tweeting about this webinar, please use the hashtag inkjet. So I'm going to hand it off to Pat and Mark now. And um, if you have any, if anybody watching the webinar has any questions, just ask them in the chat window and I will ask them for you. And Pat and Mark, I know you know that sometimes you guys will say something that will set me off. So hopefully you'll allow me to interject my excitement and or curiosity about as we're moving along. We are here because of what you bring to the pie. So uh, I think many of you listening may know Mark and I, we, we regularly appear out across the industry. My short story is I've been doing this for 35 years, helping people communicate. Been working with inkjet printing for over a decade now, and it's been a, a heck of a ride. Uh, my favorite things to do are to help people understand how to make it work for them and how to make money with it. And uh, my partner in crime on many of these adventures is my good buddy, Mark Johnson. So Mark, what do we need to know about you? Oh, that was nice. Hey, um, so I've been doing, Pat and I have been together for probably close to a decade now in various capacities around the industry dealing with inkjet. I've been involved with every major transition that we've seen as a, as a printing industry, all the way back to manual stripping and drum scanners going back to desktop publishing and you know, the original digital imaging on press, which now we're seeing the transition from, I don't want to say it's replacing offset, but I want to say that there's a lot of work that's moving, more value-added work that's moving from offset to digital. So this is just another transition, and I don't want to say it's the same movie all over again, but we've seen these kinds of major fork-in-the-road kind of shifts in the industry, and this is one of them. This is, this is a big one of them where a lot of printers are kind of rethinking their businesses, and it's been a really fun experience. I've got a dual role. I do both the marketing side of the house, getting the message out there, but I also have hand-to-hand -hand engagement with customers in a business development role, so helping them package up their stories, talk to their clients, and make that change actually happen, which is fun. So hopefully we're going to do a little bit of that here with you guys today. Yeah, in our world, Mark generally works in, in North America, and I generally work outside of North America, so we spend a lot of time sharing stories because we find that our customers do different things based on their cultures and their the businesses and industries they're supporting. So uh, that's what, again, as Mark said, that's what we want to share with you today. So we want to start out, um, you're going to see a lot of pictures and not a lot of text on these slides. And, and a lot of the reason for that is because we honestly believe that a picture is worth a thousand words. And we love it even better when we can be in front of you and let you touch and feel the things our customers are producing. These two pieces are actually out of Europe. The one on uh, the left that is the Richardson uh, catalog is printed by a company called Mac Print based in Toulouse in France. And the one on the right is printed by a company called Rotolito, which is based outside of Milan in Italy. In both of these cases, the insides of the, of the catalogs are done with inkjet web presses. The one on the left 
is done with a T230, and the one on the right is done with a T360. And in each one of these cases, these catalogs are now variable catalogs. They didn't used to be. But now the manufacturers have the ability to produce catalogs targeted to different demographics across their customer base. And the covers are done with their indigos. And again, because they do digital covers on their indigos, they're able to target the covers to different demographics. So the one on the left, it's a little bit hard to tell on the, the webinar uh, screen, but this is actually a nuts and bolts and fittings and findings catalog. So there are uh, were a lot of considerations for this. Uh, they had to be able to show uh, the number of threads on a screw. They had to be able to accurately portray hex bolts and, and different types of, of fittings and findings. So it was a big step for them to decide to make the leap into inkjet, but they've been nothing but delighted with the results ever since. The one on the right, the moped catalog, the one I'm showing is from 2012. They've been doing it uh, twice a year ever since. It was the same issue, but, but with a slightly different mentality. Their concern was making sure the colors were accurate because they're showing teen clothing. So what they wanted to make sure of is that when they showed you know, a, a specific blue or a specific pattern, that all of that was represented accurately on the inkjet print. And Mark, we've got customers in the US who do very similar types of catalogs. Absolutely. Mark? Absolutely. Uh, we've got customers. And what's really neat about using digital technology for catalogs is the ability to run them in much, much smaller run lengths and more frequently has been a big change that we're seeing. A lot of it's in B2B space, which is also an interesting thing that we're seeing is, is more B2B catalogs. And you think online is, is the easiest way to get new information out there. We're finding a lot of B2B customers are looking to get that catalog because it shares around the office much easier. It's, it's easier to communicate, yeah. more tactile. One of my new favorite ones is uh, from Hudson Printing in Salt Lake. They're doing the one for tool uh, for the, uh, the people who make you know bike racks and and all those bits and pieces. From a catalog perspective, I think it's just a brilliant execution. Can I ask well, you? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, going back to uh, the ma the magazines, the pieces that you, the catalogs you were showing before, um, is there, because you're combining two technologies, is there like a quantity sweet spot we're talking here? Even thick amount of pages in the catalogs? Not really. Not really, no. Um, I, you know, we have customers who are successful printing single copies of catalogs on demand. We have customers who are successful printing them in small batches, like one or two boxes, maybe 10 or 15 catalogs at a time in a box, and sending them out to distributors. And we have customers who are successful printing you know, bulk, big, long runs, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 catalogs and putting them out into a distribution network. So I think a lot of it comes down to the kinds of customers they're serving and, and what kind of supply chain um, uh, deal they want to make with the people that they're serving, with the, with the brands they're serving in their distributor networks. See, and that's Go ahead. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry. I, if I could just follow up uh, quickly. Um, every time you say web press, I'm thinking it has to be a gigantic quantity. That's why my brain is not processing that. So that's why I'm asking the question. If there's, if you're interested in this technology, do you have to only be a high volume printer? That's a great point, Deb. I'm glad you brought that up because when we say web press, a lot of traditional print buyers are thinking super long runs. In the digital web press era, you know, the the run lengths we've got people doing things, you know, in in the hundreds, in the you know, multiple versions of dozens even. What I wanted to to, to key on though was the, the hybridization. When you merge the two technologies together, there's really no barrier because the cover is, is in, primarily in these applications, the cover is being printed on indigos. And because of the breadth of sizes we've got in the indigo product line, all the way from you know the old 13 by 19 standard up to the new large size format 10,000, we've got people, and, and think about some of the healthcare books that are being done with you know two inch spines, no problem running those kinds of covers. And the hybridization, that's, that's just a no brainer. That's easy. It is, and, and we do have customers who, who do play that mix and match game, right? 
they may start printing a long run catalog on an offset press with an indigo cover. They may then, for reprints, bring it over to their inkjet web press and do the shorter runs for the rest of the life of the catalog. They may do the same thing for, um, they may start with an inkjet and then uh, if the runs get small enough or if, if there are different production considerations, they may switch back and forth between printing on their inkjet web press for the guts or printing on their indigo for the guts. So any possible combination we could come up with, somewhere in the world there's a customer doing it today. And also think some of them are offering these catalogs on indigos. Yeah, yeah, many of these catalogs spend time being 100% indigo, and then sometimes they move out as the catalog volumes increase, then they move them onto an inkjet web press. This Richardson catalog that's on the screen used to be 100% indigo. Uh, when it first made its trip off of offset to digital, it went from offset to indigo. And then as the volumes increased, because their ability to create a targeted conversation with their distributor networks was so successful, they started getting more and more orders, higher and higher volumes, and that was when they made the decision to move the inside, the, the book block printing for the catalog, over to their inkjet, but keep the catalog cover on the indigos. Anything you can think of, somebody's doing. So that same technology, that same workflow that works for the Richardson catalog and, and for the, the Moped catalog that you just saw is also very appropriate for short run magazines. And this one is very specifically a short run magazine that's done for a concert series in Italy. Now, not everybody is willing to put out a magazine for their concert series. In this case, it was a very short run requirement. They didn't need millions. They needed 5,000 to 10,000 for each one of the concerts over the course of a summer. So the solution was, uh, and, and to be honest, this used to be an offset project for this customer. They used to just bite the bullet and do it on their offset press because they wanted to do the work, but it really wasn't a money maker on their offset. Now, moving it over to their inkjet web press and using the indigo for the covers, now this is a revenue making piece for them because they're able to print them as they need them over the course of the summer. They can actually adjust the content <clears throat> over the course of the summer with no real impact to the workflow. So the promoter is exceedingly happy because he can constantly adjust it over the course of the summer. Acts drop out, acts come in, and he's still getting the quality and the, the cost per, per, per magazine that he wanted to get. And Mark, we have customers all over the U.S. who are doing a lot of magazine work. And it's the same story. It's it's magazines where you know we've seen the net the net pages being produced on magazines you know going down just a little bit, but the number of titles going up dramatically. So as that happens, as the run lengths become shorter, it just becomes much more more commonplace to see magazines done with digital technology. And sometimes even a traditionally printed magazine with some inkjet content either on the outside or in some cases on the inside is in. Yeah, we, and you know, the, the, your point about the number of titles is, is true. If you look at all the statistics, uh, run per titles are going down, but the number of titles is exploding. Yep. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to ask the question, but you mentioned workflow a second ago, and that's um, actually something that um, when I was you know, talking to people before the webinar that they were really interested in understanding how everything communicates with each other and what, what the workflow process is. So if you think about a traditional piece, whether it's the, the um, catalogs we just looked at, this magazine, or even uh, books like you see here on the screen, which are again inkjet book blocks with, with indigo covers. Uh, you're, you're dealing with first a content workflow. Somebody has to write all the content. There's a you know some nice person goes and gets it in the right format and and creates the work. Sometimes they're data driven, so maybe there are, are IT or data people who are involved and software products that are involved that allow them to use data in a database to trigger. Uh, image replacement or content replacement based on uh, rules that they write. 
right? And that's a, it's a complex process, not, not horrible, but it's a complex process. And there are a whole bunch of specialists who do that. At some point, a, a file is produced for print. And that file can be produced in one of two ways. It can be produced as one big massive file that then gets file transferred to the, the printer and into the, the press workflow. Or <clears throat> oftentimes, uh, the content owners send both data and objects to their printer. And, and it's the print service provider who actually, on the fly, when they kick the job off, merges everything together to create your copy of a catalog with your name on it, my copy with my name on it, a copy for Mark, and maybe your uh, catalog has a bunch of images of Florida, but Mark's has a bunch of images of San Diego, and mine has images of the Rocky Mountains, right? That, that can, so it can be done either of those two ways. Once the, that file starts to get towards the press, there are a series of workflow gateways that a, a print job will go through. Um, there's usually some um, management information system software in there that has to understand, you know, how many pages is this job really going to be? And then applying some costs to that job, right? Uh, uh, when we print the job and it's a four-color job, it's going to be this much per page. Uh, maybe that MIS uh, system is also looking at the press itself to figure out if there's uh, over-inking going on and we're going to upcharge for the job. So there's that whole piece of costing workflow and management workflow. And then there's the workflow piece that actually manages getting the job from basically onboarded onto the press through the digital front end and make sure that the press is going to perform appropriately for the job setting it up so it knows how many pages it's expecting, um, what the color profile for the press is, right? Because we can control uh, how much ink we're putting down. We can read ICC profiles and, and uh, make sure that the press is respecting that. And then there's the back end workflow. Once the print comes out the back end, there's a whole finishing workflow. And all of that might be driven by barcodes that are on each page. That, so that the finishing equipment knows what to do. So somewhere back upstream, somewhere had somebody had to go put all those barcodes into the print file. So workflow is a huge piece of the print story. It's a really complex piece of the print story. And frankly, it's, the, its complexity has nothing to do with whether you're printing inkjet or indigo. It's just the fact of life of printing in a digital world. There are a lot of, of bits and pieces that have to get roped together. That makes sense. Kind of makes sense. Okay, it, it's a big. It's a, it's big. That no, it totally totally makes sense. My my apologies. My I had muted my microphone just in case. Uh, you know, I sneezed or something. Yeah. Well, we all do that. Can we I ask you that. another so, question? As long as we're talking about workflow, and then and then I'll yeah. stop. Um, how does uh so when it comes to choosing the paper for these jobs, because it's going to have to go on two machines or through two processes, I mean, what cut types of considerations do people have to make before they start? I think the bottom line is that you normally look for papers that are appropriate for each technology you're going to use. So it, it's, it's a really rare situation for us to use the exact same paper on an Indigo that we would use on an inkjet web press. Um, we might buy them from the same vendors, but typically they have different classes of paper. Mark, when you have conversations with, with the North American customers, um, do they normally buy from the same vendors for, for both of their machines? Do they look for some compatibilities? No, definitely. So one, one of the things you're going to find is you, in a lot of the applications we've looked at so far, you're looking at covers and, and guts, right? So the covers are definitely a different paper. And in many cases, the covers are also getting laminated too. So we've got a lot of customers with inline lamination on the indigos. So the covers gonna have a much, much different look than the guts. Um, in the cases of um, where you're doing a lightweight glossy on the inside, you're gonna want obviously, you know, some kind of a gloss on the cover. I, I, their merchants are gonna be the same. I don't know many customers who want to spread their business across, you know, five, six, seven merchants. They're going to want to try to bundle their business as best they can. Not necessarily with one, one paper manufacturer, but one merchant for sure. 
So, so Mark, uh, this piece I just moved over to on the screen is a piece that we know has been printed on just about every print technology you can print a piece on. And, and I know that they've got some sensitivities to paper. So how, how is it that, that a piece that, that prints both on Indigo and Inkjet, where it's the same content, how do you go through the process of making decisions about the, the paper in those cases? Yeah, this is a good one because in this case, when you're dealing with fashion and magazine and higher end stuff, you know, very the print specifier is going to have a brand and a weight, you know, practically a, a order number, right, that they're going to want this printed on. So what they're going to look for, the printer's going to try to match that as best as possible. Now, in many cases, you know, we'll have a paper that is very much similar or identical to what the specification is. In some cases, not, and they've got to do some playing back and forth. Um, in this case, they're using some of the different glossy inkjet medias to get that, that heavyweight gloss effect. And on the indigo, we've got papers that match almost identically. But it's going to depend on content of the image, you know, the amount of coverage. Um, in some cases, like in this one, they actually took took some of the Neiman Marcus pieces and, and used Skodex technology after the fact, after it was imaged on the Indigo. So that also has an effect on what paper you use. Um, mm -hmm. What we've seen over the last couple of years, the the whole idea with if I'm going to print with inkjet, I have to go through all of these hoops and get special papers. That's getting to be less of an issue. Not only are there more inkjet coated and inkjet treated papers around, more and more vendors, HP included, are introducing technology that lets you prime those papers before they're printed. So a broader compatibility. Yep, I think that the, I think overall the paper issues that we used to just used to just kill us uh, have largely gone. Now this piece um, is part of an outsert campaign that that is done for the the Hearst family of magazines. And they've, of course, have, they've accepted both levels of print. They've accepted indigo quality. They've accepted inkjet quality on behalf of these uh, rather famous brands. So we, we think that the, overall that the tide is turned when it comes to saying that uh, for some reason digital printing isn't appropriate for high-end brands anymore. I think we're past that. Yeah, paper used to be trying to cross the Grand Canyon, you know, 10 years ago. Then it became just crossing a river a couple years ago. Now it's just a bridge. Yeah, and, and sometimes you cross it, sometimes you don't. Now, Mark, I've switched over to this next piece, which is actually a self-promotion piece for uh, one of our customers. And this thing is pretty brilliant. It, well, I, I think Deborah might, might even jump in at some point because she helped uh, judge this one. This was a winner. And I didn't pick this because she liked it so much. I picked it because I think what it does, this is a printer in Minneapolis GLS companies who is a very, and I say strange printer in the most wonderful ways. Um, not only are they a printer, they're also an ad agency. They bought a company and under one group of companies, they've got an incredibly talented ad agency. You know, they're so good that I'm even using them. And they're also a printer, an interaction printer and agency together. Oh my gosh, what that lets you do is the agency comes up with an idea, the printer says yes or no, we can do it. That's usually the way things work. In this case, you've got these incredibly talented people at the printer side who are coming up with these ideas and saying, hey, agency, look at what we can do. And all of a sudden, magic happens. And that's what this campaign was. It was magic happening, where they wanted to get the word out to print buyers and agencies and retailers in you know, their market and tell them what's possible with digital print today. So this, this piece was all digitally driven. There's something north of 24 different variableized pieces in this campaign. And it's all data driven based on who's getting it. So whether you're the digital dude or the digital diva, that's an easy one, boy or girl. But then what you do, where you're a retailer or a financial services company, that's going to drive different content. And it just keeps keeps going down from there. And what they did is they used the Indigo 10,000 that they've got, and they maximized the size. So this thing folds out to a gorgeous poster of the city you're in. So you see Minneapolis in this particular one, but it could be Milwaukee. It could be, you know, pick your favorite city. And you'll see that be a variable piece, but utilizing the size of the indigo. Now, these guys do not currently have inkjet, but they also work with other printers in town that do have inkjet, and they're actually doing a campaign for me using our friends in Wisconsin to print that piece. So they're, they're very cognizant of what's possible and mixing and matching technologies, but I wanted to make sure that, that for this audience, we showed you that printers are promoting themselves, and that's actually a big piece of the puzzle. When we talk about any of this technology, 
packaging it together and telling your market what you can do is so critically important. We try to do it as a vendor. Some of the most yeah. successful printers, some of the most successful ones we work with around the world are the ones who have figured out that practicing with their press, with self-promotion material, is the best thing that they can do. Walk the talk, produce it, get it out into the mail stream, get it out into your, your constituency, let them see the, what you can really do. It is the most important thing they can do. I mean, uh, qu quite frankly, I always, you know, ref refer everyone back to the paper companies. There is nobody that understands that better than them. Look at a swatch book. It's every possible way you can use their paper with every possible printing technology it works with. Every printer should literally have a swatch book of all of their capabilities, showing them, um, not assuming that people should know. And um, I just want to interject one other thing about this piece. This actually won the uh, GPA, uh, Specialty Substrates, has a printing um, contest, and this was printed on their material, and that's that's what it, it won the big prize for that. And Mark, this piece was also interactive, if I remember correctly. I forgot to mention that. If you look on the left-hand side, really, really tiny, you're going to see a QR code, and they worked with a virtual reality component with this. So as you put your smartphone or tablet up to the piece and launch the um, in this case, I think they were using Layer. Launch that, you'll see the whole piece come to life. So now we're talking about not just print, we're talking marketing. Yeah, that and that's going to be the future, I think. Now, we, we also, uh, we've come a long way when it comes to matching brand colors and getting brand acceptance, Mark. And, and I wanted you to tell this story because this is a pretty famous brand with a, a pretty radical story. And a pretty persnickety CEO on top of that, right? So Martha's yeah. extremely detail-oriented. So when this campaign for her made her American made product line was launched, this was a big deal. And it was done in New York and it was it had to be perfect. It had to look a certain way and perform to her specification. So initially when this was done by the printer, you know, they proofed it on an indigo because it was a large format piece. It was going to be printed in an offset, and they gave her a proof. And she signed off on the proof, loved it, was gorgeous, colors all matched, and then they printed it. And when the print was delivered, it was rejected because it didn't look as good as the proof. So this is a case, and I'm bringing it up in this session because I think this is the best possible example of a hybrid piece, right? This is, we're running it on one technology, and that's, it was such an impressive ability to hit color on the indigo with all of its capabilities that it actually won out over the offset. And that's something that printers have to become very, very cognizant of is when you're showing off, you know, the amazing quality that some of these digital devices can produce, you got to kind of keep it in mind that that may set an expectation, which in this case is great. Wait, um, Mark, and, Mark, I'm really sorry. I'm confused. So you're saying that you proofs were run off the indigo. She's Martha Stewart signed off on them, and then for some reason the job was run on offset for whatever re reason. And then she, when she received those offset magazines, she said it wasn't up to her standards. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. And, and the beauty of this is there's so many print specifiers, and, I, and I'm not going to say anything negative about a print print specifier because they're they have a, a set way of doing things, and this was specified to be run on offset. Period, stop, end of discussion. That's just the way it was bid out. That's the way it was done. And in this case, the quality was so much higher on digital. And the cost, really, because of the run length, it wasn't a terribly long run. Because of that, it actually made sense to do it on digital. So because of, of that rejection, it actually opened up the conversation where they could talk about, hey, wait, digital has some advantages, and the cost isn't as much as I thought it would be. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we should be specifying things a little more flexibly. So it was a good conversation to have. Okay, this is going to be a very remedial question, but now I'm really confused. How do you proof something from a digital press if you're not making a plate? Exactly. This, this is a decades-old old issue. As, as people got more and more into digital printing, the question became, how do I proof? Because I'm used to making match prints, right? I do it from the exact file using the same technology. How do we make a proof look like offset? We've got color calibration and color matching, which this piece did match color. It just didn't have the same level of depth, quality that they expected because a four color process offset doesn't match up with what they were running on the Indigo. They actually ran some spe uh, RGB on this. Uh, the violet ink was added to this one. So 
proofing on digital to run an offset is something that people have crossed that chasm because think about CTP. How do you proof when you're running CTP? Right? So we, we crossed this bridge a while ago. In the old days, you would take the actual pieces of film and then you would go make a match print or a, a chromolin from that film and then proof the exact piece of film that would make the plate. When we made the jump to CTP, digital proofing became much, much more accepted. And using an indigo as a digital proofer is something that we're seeing more and more of happening across the world. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're not saying that Martha Stewart approved a PDF and then didn't like the color on her offset piece. Exactly. She no, liked the she, she actually liked what she saw from the indigo print. Oh, okay. See, that's where I was confused. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Right? So, Mark, the, the other story uh, that is, it's a, been a big part of your life and my life for the last couple of years is a partnership with Adweek around the possibilities. And, and of course, we work for HP. And we don't only have indigos and, and uh, high-speed inkjet web presses. We have in our family of print products a whole lot of other stuff. And, and this Ad Week campaign was intended to really talk to all of the things you could do across this wide range. But a, a huge number of these pieces are indigo pieces. And, and actually, it turned out a fair number of them ended up being inkjet pieces as well. Yep, the, 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 the collection of stories that we worked on, the, the whole purpose of doing this project with Adweek was to get the message out to the agencies, the brands, the people who are creating content, like, hey, guys, here's what's possible. And that, it, it, it was a series of inserts to the magazine, direct mail pieces, as well as a couple of events that we hosted. And what we did is we, it still lives on. And if you go to the website that we put up there, adweek.com, um, essay section, art, dash possibilities and it's on the screen. If you go to that, you will see all of these stories. Many of them are in video format, but these let you see how the brand evolved their project, whether it was a label, whether it was a sleeve shrink wrap, whether it was a book or a mailer or a dimensional piece or a box. So there's lots of different pieces in here, even wallpapers and wraps. I mean, we go crazy with this covering every possible technology that we as HP make. But the purpose of this really wasn't to, to, to try to sell anybody an HP device. It was to get the brands thinking outside of their boxes. You know, what, what's possible with digital technology? And we've gotten so many people that have referred to this and worked on it. It's just been, been an incredible experience to see ideas and light bulbs go off. There were a lot of variations, too, because I know that uh, in my big box of, of print samples, I have variations of the, the insert pieces that were targeted to direct mailers or commercial printers or agencies or, or and buyers. So there was a lot of effort put into trying to tell the right story to the right demographic within the Adweek community. And I think we hadn't actually ever done that before, so it was a pretty cool idea. Yep. So um, beyond this, um, I mean, it's it's a pretty big world we live in, Mark. And the whole idea of this webinar was to talk about how both Indigo and Inkjet work together to benefit our customers, help them make money, help them develop revenue models that make sense for the customers that they serve. There's a, just an amazing array of things you can do in the Indigo world that I think a lot of people don't know about. That's what we've discovered, and and you know, with my business development hat on, I spend a lot of time with printers, helping them craft their story, and and in some cases, hosting events. And we've had printers, you know, this has probably been the most most rewarding part of my job is I've now got commercial printers who are hosting events on a regular basis, open houses, lunch and learns, where they're you know, we just had one in Michigan where they had over 150 of their customers and clients and agencies come in to see what's different, what's new, what can they, they now do. And that's the really cool stuff. We want to see you know, people take this technology and do things we never dreamed of with it. So what we're going to do at Graph Expo is kind of take that, that, that umbrella and bring it into our show booth. We're going to have a series of 15-minute quick hit sessions where we'll show you what the technology is if you're a printer, but we'll also have printers get up and talk about how they've told their story. And you know all the different things that we can do on the indigo side of the house, whether it's textures, white ink, invisible ink, raised print, spot colors, all of that stuff. 
we'll show some of the samples, not our stuff, but stuff that our customers have done, let our customers talk about it, but also have the experts on hand. So if somebody wants to have a deep dive into, well, wait a minute, how'd you do that? And how would I incorporate that into my story? We'll have the business development team there as well to have those conversations. So that, that's a big part of what we want to do at Graph Expo is not make it a show. I mean, we're going to obviously have equipment there, but we don't want to make it, you know, open up the hood and see how all the technology works. I think we can do that really well with YouTube. What we want to do with this show is have the more meaningful conversations of what this technology means to a printer and their growth and how they craft their story and tell their story. Right. So in the Indigo story, in it, when we get to Graph Expo and you come into the HP booth, you won't be able to miss it, the Indigo story because it, it's such a big part of the, the story that we bring to Graph Expo. It's not the only story we're telling, though, at Graph this year. And part of uh, Graph this year will be the introduction of our new concept of a giant digital leap ahead. And we'll be bringing uh, a lot of our uh, HDNA samples. And HDNA, this, this uh, sort of DNA bug you see here on the bottom of the screen, is our, our logo for high definition nozzle architecture. And this is our new HP inkjet printing technology that doubles the number of nozzles in the print head. And that allows us to get some pretty amazing uh, print images. And, and don't worry if you can't read everything on here. Please come by and see us at, at Graph Expo. This will be part of a giant 10 foot long wall. You'll definitely be able to, to read it there. But part of the story of, of our new technology on the inkjet side is that we're, we're smoothing out the rough edges. Uh, with the new technology, uh, gradients and, and long uh, contones become exactly what you want them to be. Uh, and they, they take on that, that look and feel that you expect from high quality printing. And the, the importance of that is that it opens up just a, an amazing array of general commercial print work that I think some customers might have been a little bit worried about taking on on a high-speed web press. The other part of our HDNA story is, is a speed story. So when you start looking at uh, print capacity and you start looking at um, the, the ability to produce things in very short SLAs, uh, HDNA gives us the ability to uh, meet those needs as well. So. Uh, in all in all, it's a big part of our upgradability story, right? We've been telling you for years in the market that if you buy an HP inkjet web press, um, it, it's upgradable, and it's going to be upgradable for a long time to come. So if you bought our very first press uh, from us back, uh, what is it now, Mark, uh, seven years ago? Um, if, if you bought the very first one, uh, today you could have what is effectively still a brand new press just by continuing to upgrade it along the way. And in fact, our very first customer was O'Neill Data Systems, and they've done exactly that. They've uh, not only kept that original press completely up to date, and, and uh, they will tell anyone that they feel like they always have a brand new press, but they've added uh, a whole family, uh, a whole herd of additional inkjet web presses to keep that one company. So there's, there's a lot to that story, and most of our customers around the world buy these inkjet web presses because they know they are upgradable over time. So please, if you're coming to Graph Expo, please come see us and, and hear more about our HDNA story. Let us show you some of our print samples. You can touch them, feel them. You can even take them home with you. And uh, we hope you'll, you'll discover what we know, which is that these are, I think, definitely that giant digital leap ahead that we've been looking for for inkjet web presses. Now, in addition to our story around 20 inch and 30 inch and 42 inch, uh, inkjet web presses, which is a lot of versatility. Um, we're also coming to uh, the, the show with a story about our 110 inch wide uh, simplex high speed uh, color inkjet press. This is uh, considered a packaging press, uh, to be honest. It, it now becomes part of the family with our 400 simplex inkjet web press, which is used for packaging as well. Um, sadly, we can't bring our presses to Graph Expo. They don't give us enough time to build them. 
uh, and take them back down. So uh, we're, we're confined to having to show you pictures of them and, and videos of them in action. And it, it's even trickier with this one because the, the machine that our 110 inch uh, print bar sits on is 15 feet tall and 18 feet deep. So it's kind of uh, room size all by itself. We are not bringing that to a show. Uh, anytime soon. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure if we would ever bring one of these to a show. Um, but we will be bringing a, a view of the print bar so that you can sort of stand next to it and get a sense of just exactly how long 110 inches is. Mm -hmm. And we'll be showing that in comparison to the 40, uh, the 42, the 30, and the 20 inch uh, print bar so that you can get a sense of just how versatile uh, that inkjet uh, range is. And the other thing that we will be doing is, is talking a lot about what new kinds of applications uh, we see opening up in the inkjet space. We were talking before the webinar started about uh, adding some new kinds of uh, post-processing and finishing, and, and uh, we'll be uh, playing with and piloting a whole bunch of really cool ideas uh, ahead of Drupa. So if you're you're right now making plans for Drupa, uh, you'll want to come see us because we're going to be bringing a lot of unusual things there. But for the Graph Expo part of our story, we we want to make sure everybody is is completely up to speed with the the new uh, inkjet quality story. Um, we're not saying that it's offset class. We're not saying it's near offset. We're telling you outright, it's offset quality. Go ahead and compare it to offset. We we have no fear, and, and we invite you to come and make the comparison. We we, we actually have we we've we've actually done that, Pat. We've shown people uh, the we offset have. offset insides and the inkjet covers, and asked them just random questions about it, and no one had any idea that it was different. And the funny thing is that we did that with the current generation, with the right. generation one. It is right. It wasn't even generation two yet, and right. we we had people who simply couldn't tell them apart. And and now when you you bring us the, we bring this new technology to the marketplace, I, now all of a sudden you know all excuses are out the window. You 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 don't believe that digital is for you. Please come and look because th this is pretty cool, and it's going to be um, I, I think eye opening to a lot of people who who didn't believe that uh, digital was for them or that inkjet was for them. I think between the indigo story and the inkjet story, uh, it, it's pretty amazing what people are doing. And our customers amaze me every day. They do things. So Mark showed the piece, and I, I, I want to get back to the, the transparent piece here, the transparent substrate down in this bottom. And we typically thought of that as, as being uh, an indigo sweet spot that they could print on all these interesting substrates. And I have a customer today in the world of inkjet printing on a transparent substrate a stop, roll them, of stop, transparent stop, substrate. Stop. Stop. I need a second. Uh, yeah. Wait, what? That printed on a web press? No, no, no. So this one was printed on an indigo. Oh, right? okay. okay. Right. But I have a customer who is printing clear posters. He's printing on a PET substrate, a roll of PET substrate that was uh, quite honestly originally designed to go through a, a sign machine. And he mounted it on his web press, and he's printing clear posters. Oh my God! We've got Deb. We've got some people. We've also got guys doing labels that go on products. That, that this was never something we thought of for the web press as an application. And it's not that yeah. they're doing long runs of them. It's that they need them so quickly, and they need so many different variations. This one's actually a water heater application. Because think about it, you got 30 gallon, 40 gallon, 50 gallon, 60 gallon. You got different brand names. You've got different points of of state regulations. So all regulations, heck, the, the regulations can change by county in some states, right? You know, so so that's, that's yeah, we, we've got customers doing stuff with inkjet web presses you have never even thought of. Also, versus digital, I don't think that's an argument anymore. I think we've we've hit table stakes point where you know it, the output quality is. And I'm not going to say good enough because I hate that phrase, but the offset quality is excellent. And whether it's done on three or four different technologies, it's all excellent and perfectly acceptable. Now we can talk about what digital lets you do with the personalization, the versioning, the micro versioning, all that fun stuff, the time to market. 
being able to print it in four different locations, you know, think about that. I've got to print 10,000 of something, but if I can do it 2,500 in four different locations and hit my mailboxes sooner, what does that do for the mailer? So now all of a sudden, all of these digital advantages, that becomes the more important discussion, not how was ink put on paper. Right. So we have about 10 minutes left, and I do have some questions that I've been gathering. If this is a good time, Mark, is it cool? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. So one, I just need to interject right now because of something that uh, Mark just said. Uh, and we touched we touched upon workflow process before, but where does color management come in if, if we're talking about using two different processes and we're trying to make it look, I mean, Obviously, somebody knows how to do something because nobody could tell the difference between the the offset and the inkjet when it was printed together. But um, so, can you can you just touch upon that a little, please? Pat, you want Mark, to take? Can take it? Okay, I'll take it. I I'll start if you finish. Sure. You start. I'll start. You finish. So, so here's the trick with color management. Um, all of our machines uh, can read ICC profiles. So if you develop an ICC profile for your job where you are specifying your expectations, your color expectations of the job, the press can respect that and will respect it. So it would be easy to say, you build an ICC profile and everything's fine and walk away and, and trust me, it'll be fine. To be honest, that's not actually accurate because in, in typical situations, we're using different substrates, right? Different paper on an indigo versus on an inkjet versus on an offset press. So there are subtle differences to how they lay color down. There are subtle differences in how they they um, they build the formulas around, you know, how they, they take a Pantone and turn it into a, a CYMK formula. In an inkjet world, we don't have spot colors. Our, our inkjet presses don't have spot colors. In an indigo world, you can acquire and buy the, the spot color ink, which gives you a lot more freedom and flexibility. In our world, though, it's always going to be a formula. So in that case, you want to do some testing. So the very first thing you want to do is you want to look at your file and you want to understand what device that file was built for. Very often in commercial print, they were built for offset originally. Even if they've been printed digitally for 10 years, they may have all originally been built for offset. And one of the first uh, big things that we see that we suggest customers change is to go in and take a hard look at the file and see where the ink settings were set. Because very often when you're building a file for, ink, for, um, for offset, you develop the profile for the images within the file and the file itself to over ink. So you may be setting ink levels at 200% or 300% because in an offset world that's sort of traditional in order to get that great saturation and look. You come to inkjet, um, you can have 100%. And if what comes at me is this color is set at 300% and this color is set at 200% and this color is set at, at 180%, I have to do some calculations and, and normalization and optimization to try and guess what you think that means for my device. So instead of making the press guess and then being disappointed with what it does, it makes a whole lot more sense from a workflow perspective that when you're moving jobs from device to device, that you actually build the file for the device you intend to print on. And that does mean going back to the original files and taking a look at them and managing them, uh, putting them through a color management process for the target device. Indigo is a whole lot friendlier to an offset prepared file because it really is a very, very similar to an offset process. But even there, you're going to find that you're going to want to, you're going to want to take a look at it and try and manage for it. And Mark, I think our customers, we've been trying to teach them this for the, for the last few years. I think they're catching on. I would agree with that. I mean, the, the whole idea of color management is it's all based on the final output and the perception that you put into the profile. So whether it's indigo or inkjet, you know, dot structures, it, it's not so much as the, the, the structure of the piece, the, the way the dots are built, it's the perceived color. And that's what ICC is all about. And everything we do is perfectly ICC compliant. Now, keep in mind, there is, the, you know, the, the big variation in this whole mix is paper. So when you're trying to go from offset to inkjet, 
you know, is the paper the same brightness? There's a lot of things that go into this this ICC profile building, and you're going to have different profiles for different papers, for different output instances, but all of that sounds really complicated, but when all said and done and, and, and the rubber meets the road, printers have successfully, and I'm not talking four sites of the same printer, I'm talking four different companies have been able to work together and have in four different locations the same quality output. And that's important. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Deborah, you heard that story when we were at DScoop earlier this year that uh, the Rotolito guys in Italy partner with King Printing yeah. in the U.S. with uh, with Addy, and and they they sort of timeshare some of the jobs based on where they need to be delivered, and they they do it successfully, delivering yeah. the exact same quality in two different countries. That that's my favorite international relationship. The brothers from another mother. Those guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, another question we got was um, people are very curious to how many of these inkjet presses are out there in the world. So, Mark, do you want to start with the, the, the nice indigo number? Let's start there. Well, I was going to I was going to let you talk about inkjet numbers. Um, indigo. Oh, you caught me flat footed. I don't have my final number. Thousands. Yeah. I mean, it's thousands. Right. For some reason, I think it's four, four, four thousand. But maybe I'm crazy. You it's it's somewhere between four and five. I mean, we install new ones every day, right? Yeah. But on the inkjet world, so here's the funny thing. In terms of physical machines installed around the world, we're just a little under 200 of them, right? And you might say, oh, my God, there's only 200 of them. That can't be right. I mean, however, what you actually have to look at is the print capacity that those presses represent because... Uh, a good number of those presses, more than a third of those presses, are 42-inch wide presses that are running, you know, six and 800 feet per minute. And a lot of these presses are installed in sites that are running them 24 hours a day. So when you start looking at the number of pages, A4 pages is the, the sort of industry norm for calculating pages. So we've printed over 100 billion pages on our presses. Um, in a very short time, because you have to remember, we were almost the last high volume manufacturer into the market. And yet what we did is we came into the market with three sizes that, that print at very high speed. So when you start adding up how many pages we're actually printing, it's a pretty amazing number. And that number increments now so fast, you can almost set a clock. And it, it's actually in the tens of thousands of pages a second that it's incrementing every single day of every single week right now. So that number is just going to keep on getting bigger and bigger, and it's going to be very hard for anyone to catch it because of our capacity. Absolutely. That's incredible. I mean, where I are mean, the... Go ahead, just Mark. Give you the number that I, I didn't have on the top of my head. 4,350 customers with 6,680 presses are out there today right now. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're at the top of the hour, so I just wanted to um, also make mention that um, HP will be in the Printiverse at Graph Expo for three events, actually. Um, on yeah. Monday, we have a lunch with Indigo, which will be a show and tell uh, to come and get Printspiration and see all the incredible things that can be done with the Indigos. And then at four o'clock on Monday, we're having a book making uh, cocktail party where HP Indigo will be there and GP special, GPA specialty substrates and Fastbind USA and a software company called Lumapix. And basically we're going to have the entire food chain of how any um, commercial printer can get into the short run bookmaking biz along with drinks. So uh, make sure you stop by HP Indigo to get your drink tickets because that's the only way to get a cocktail. Uh, the other event that we're doing um, again, and uh, thank you very much for making this happen. Pat is on Tuesday on Girls Who Print Day. We're actually having a, in, a inkjet case study cafe. So, um, Again, you're going to bring your customers who have uh, obviously been very successful at their inkjet work and um, not not just at what they're doing, but literally inventing new marketing as they're going along. I, I like to call them the print pioneers. So I'm very thrilled to have um, 
you guys part of what we're doing at Graph Expo um, as well. So do you guys want to leave with anything? I'll, I'll leave it to you to close this out. So uh, but on behalf of all of us over in the uh, high-speed inkjet world at HP, uh, thanks for spending some time with us. Uh, if you see us at a show, please come up and say hi. If you want to see something, uh, please ask. We're, we're happy to share everything we do. And uh, Mark, uh, I'll let you have the last word. And you know that's rare. I know, really. Um, and if you don't see us at a show and you want to see and talk to us, uh, I believe I'm going to leave this with the first slide because that's how you can find Pat and myself on Twitter. You can also find us on all of the important social medias. You've also got HP's Graphic Arts channel on YouTube. Lots of other places where you can see and hear about really, really cool inspirational stories. But if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about how, you know, I would like to dive into some of these a little bit deeper, please reach out. We love to share. And if for some reason you can't find them, you could always find me and I'll find them for you. So thank yeah, you guys. Yeah, Jeff does have us on speed dial. <laughs> I have one eight hundred HP. Thank yeah. you guys so much for for uh, sharing your information, your knowledge, um, the incredible print stuff that you do. And thanks to everybody for joining us, for watching the video. If you didn't join us, and we'll see you soon.